Recently, Saturday Night Live featured a sketch of four people going into a fortune teller's shop. Uh, maybe you've seen this, it was quite popular this past week. So they go into this fortune teller's shop and they're all excited because they, they're excited to have their fortunes read because in their words, they were having a really bad year and they were quite excited to have some good news about next year. Tell us some good news about what's coming in the future. And I'm sure that many of us this morning can probably relate to that. So tell us the future because, here's the punchline, 2019 was a really hard year. <laughs> and why is that funny? It's funny because in 2019 we had no idea how hard 2020 would actually be. If you wanted your fortune told in 2019, you probably wouldn't like the fortune that you would get. 2019 has been the year without a playbook. We have all had to reinvent ourselves in many ways without any notice and without any prior experience of living the life that we're gonna have to live uh, with this new normal. For instance, with all of the changes that we've had to make here at church, a number of you have joked with me uh, over the last several months, I bet they didn't teach you this in seminary, and you know what, you're right. They didn't. So much of what I've had to do, so much of what the elders have had to do, so much of what you've had to do in your own lives has, has been without experience. And we've had to react off the cuff to changes that we did not know were coming. This is an unpredictable situation. These are unpredictable situations, and we've had to just roll with it. Now, this year might not have been chaotic for you the way that it's been for some people, but even if this year wasn't as chaotic, there's, life is still filled with all all sorts of unpredictable situations. How many times have you lamented for a situation that's in your life where there's just no rule book, no instructions that can guarantee a good outcome? Half the time we just want some kind of instruction to get us through these situations. Just tell us what to do. What guides you in situations like these? Ideally, in situations where there is not a clear way forward, you act on principles to guide you when these clear rules don't exist. Now, acting with principles it can help us navigate situations of uncertainty. Again, even if it doesn't guarantee a good outcome, acting with principles can certainly help us. Ecclesiastes 8, our text for this morning, it drops us into some uncertain scenarios that I think are going to feel very familiar to us. This morning, providentially in God's timing, we're going to look at uncertainty regarding political power and uncertainty regarding injustice in society. Of course, these are two areas that are, are live subjects for the church today. Uh, these are live areas where Christians are trying to wrestle faithfully through this question. How should the righteous act when we face uncertainty with political power and uncertainty with societal injustice? As we explore these scenarios this morning, we're going to glean some important principles for acting wisely. Again, these principles don't guarantee a particular outcome for the church or for the communities that we live in, but they do enable us to keep our cool to do some good, and to honor God well. These principles will even help us to enjoy our lives, even in the midst of stress, challenge, and uncertainty. Now, I just want to say that the text this morning, when I laid out the series, I didn't have any connection between this particular text and this particular Sunday with the events going on. So this really is God's word for us. And so we can lean in with the confidence that God prepared this text for us today. And so let's hear now God's word to hear his message for us as he, God himself, equips us to face uncertainty with the principles of wisdom. Again, please hear with me God's word. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oaths to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? 
Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the, over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity, because the sentence against an evil de deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth. That there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom... And to see the business that's done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Brothers and sisters, this is God's word to his people, and thus far in the reading of God's word, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Lord, we bow ourselves before your word, and we ask now that you would equip us with the strength to discern your will and your ways. Give us hope in uncertain times and teach us how to be righteous in the midst of great uncertainty. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. As we dive into the text this morning, probably one of the first things that we can observe about the passage is that it's book ended by an invitation and a caution. The invitation opens up right out of the door. Find wisdom because it makes a difference. This is verse 1. The caution, how the text closes. Even the wise person can't know everything. So that's verse 17. So we're clearly going on a journey with the sage this morning where we need to walk with wisdom, but even wisdom has its limits. There's no guarantee that a right action will produce a good outcome. I think it's safe to say that we hate situations like this, don't we? It is uncomfortable to live and walk in situations where there's no guaranteed outcome. How many of us have agonized over how to vote or how to respond to the latest uh, expression of injustice in our society? See, we want to do the right thing. But we have this nagging sense that even when we do the thing that we feel like is the right thing, it's, it's not adequate. It's not up to the task. Well, somehow we're off by even just a little bit. We, even in our best efforts, find that they don't bring about all the results that we want. Even as we try to do good, we wrestle with negative, unintended consequences from our actions. So how do we navigate this? It would be so nice, don't you think, if someone would just tell us what to do. Tell us, God, what to do. But the sage this morning doesn't tell us exactly what to do. 
Instead, he tells us how to think about these situations. He tells us how to work through two very difficult scenarios that we all face and that we, this morning, are particularly facing in our culture. The first scenario is uncertainty in dealing with political power in an age when man had power over man to his hurt. In verses 2 through 9, the sage has this imaginary conversation to, with an advisor to a powerful and unpredictable king. This king possesses great authority. Like we hear in verse 4, the word of the king is supreme. But it isn't clear if this king will wield his power with justice and righteousness and wisdom, using his authority for the good of the kingdom, or if he'll use it for his own benefit. It's unpredictable. Let's look together at verse 3. The sage says, Be not hasty to go from his presence. In other words, be sure that you show your loyalty. Stick close to this king, O advisor. Don't take your stand in an evil cause. Evil here probably meaning evil in the sight of the king. Meaning don't do something that the king is going to hate. Again, show your loyalty because he does whatever he pleases. How do you advise someone who does whatever he pleases? This king probably won't appreciate a word of critique from you. Again, verse 4, who may say to him, what are you doing? So the advisor is in an incredibly hard situation. You can tell the king exactly what he wants to hear, but that's not what wise advisors do. But if you tell the king the truth and he doesn't like it, you may be in danger. So what do you do? It's uncertain, no matter what you say. Next, the sage moves from the court of the king out into the court of the public to experience the uncertainty of an unjust society. In the text, as we encounter it, this society's deep injustice expresses itself in three ways. First, wickedness goes unpunished. That's what we hear in verse 10. Instead of swiftly being brought to justice, the wicked were allowed to continue in their evil deeds. And it's a terrible picture that we see in the text. Outwardly, these people were righteous. They were going to and from the temple in their religious observance to the Lord. And when they were in the public, the people were praising them in the streets. And yet, they clearly did wicked deeds that were known by other people, and they were never held accountable. The sage goes to their funeral. He sees the wicked buried, and even at their funeral, they have never been brought to justice. This causes a second point of injustice in society. Because wickedness goes unpunished, wickedness actually increases. More people are pulled in by the temptation to be wicked. Verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil because they know that they can get away with it. And so, if wickedness goes unpunished, wickedness is on the rise, what of the righteous? Well, verse 14 tells us the righteous are the ones that are punished. That's the third injustice in this society. And the sage, when he looks at the righteous being punished, he says twice, this is vanity. How are you supposed to be righteous if it gets you punished? How are you supposed to conduct yourself if there might be unexpected backlash for a good and right action? We probably don't need to puzzle over this text for hours before we see exactly how relevant these questions are for Christians today. We live in a season of political uncertainty. Many people are concerned about about what might happen to them if the other guy wins, whoever the other guy is. There's tons of pressure to show party loyalty above everything else these days. There's widespread wickedness in our society. 
Frequently, justice is delayed, and injustice goes unpunished a lot of the time. Like the Me Too movement has revealed in the last few years, many of society's most decorated people used their power to take advantage of other people, used their power to do wicked deeds. And when the higher powers were told about what these wicked people were up to, it was the victims that were shamed the victims that were punished. The Netflix documentary Athlete A about abuse in USA Olympics is a gut-wrenching exposition of this reality that is pervasive in our culture. In addition to widespread wickedness, uh, as well, Christians face uh, backlash for our faith. And we face backlash for our faith in this country, for sure, and also especially throughout the world. So when we read the text this morning, here's one immediate takeaway. These situations, these uncertain scenarios in the text, are our situations. They are our uncertain scenarios, and often even more so as we look at the church throughout the rest of the globe. And so if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, if you stop listening from this point on, I hope you at least hear this one word of comfort. Our situations that we face today are not new. Our ears, every day when you listen to the news or when you kind of walk around, our ears are constantly filled with fuel for our anxiety fire. We are constantly hearing, we've never seen anything like this, or we've never been this close to the brink. The scholar Alan Jacobs calls this tendency presentism. Presentism, it's a historical amnesia, forgetting anything except the present experience. He writes that politicians and pastors and podcasters and bloggers can confidently assert that we are experiencing unprecedented levels of social mistrust and unrest, having conveniently allowed themselves to remain ignorant of what this country was like 50 years ago. Of course, knowledge of the past doesn't remove the pain of the present, but I think it does give us some perspective. And our text this morning, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, is a healthy antidote to our temptation towards presentism. The sage has been there before. When we think about these scenarios, the church has been there before. There's nothing new under the sun. Remember the stories throughout the Bible, Abraham, Moses, Esther, Jonah, the apostles, the early church, the exiles of 1 Peter, all of them had to cope with uncertain powers and uncertain times. We are not alone. And we have a very worthy guide who is very interested in helping us navigate these uncertain scenarios with principles of wisdom. Again, these principles don't guarantee a positive outcome, but they help us walk through uncertainty with wisdom and with grace. So here are the five principles of wisdom that come out to us from our text. Fear of God, cautious respect for our leaders, Courage to speak, enjoyment of life, and rest. Let me read those to you again. Fear of God, cautious respect for our leaders, the courage to speak, enjoyment of life, and rest. These are the five principles that we can use to navigate political uncertainty and injustices in society. First and foremost, fear God. Fear God. Verse 12 in our text says that those who fear God will find blessing. This is a major theme throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Christians must fear God. Now, if you haven't spent that much time in church, uh, you might find it strange to have a pastor saying you need to fear God. You might say, I thought God was loving. Why should I be afraid of him? Or if you're skeptical of Christianity, if you, you have grown to have some cynicism about the claims of our religion, you might say, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. I always thought that your God was a little bit of a tyrant. It makes sense to me that you would say you need to be afraid of him, fear him. But both of these responses don't quite get what it means to fear God. True fear of God is a combination of reverence 
and respect and adoration and appreciation. When we say fear God, we're not cowering in terror before a tyrant, but we're also not imagining that God is a stuffed animal that is here to just make us feel a little bit happier. Christians fear God because he's powerful, and Christians fear God because he is gracious. We see this throughout the text. God is more powerful than any earthly king, any earthly power. Verse 2, keep the king's commands because of God's oath to him. The king is only in authority because God put him there. As the ruler of a kingdom, the king has power to organize certain things, certain affairs in civil life. But as verse 17 states, only God has the power to organize the events of history. Only God has the power to organize the things of the material world. The king may be powerful enough to do whatever he wants, as the text says, but even this power is limited. Verse 8, no man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. Only God has that. And so when you're faced with any earthly power, always remember God is more powerful, and he's more gracious. As verse 15 says, God is the giver of all good gifts. He graciously blesses us with every enjoyable thing that we have in this life. And if we look at verse 12 again, we see that God ultimately takes care of those who fear him. So fear God because he's powerful, and fear God because he's kind. And he's kind even with the reality of injustice accompanying our experience of life. Injustice, suffering, death, all of these things cause many people to question God. We might think if God were both powerful and gracious, why hasn't he done anything about injustice? Why hasn't he done anything about suffering? Why hasn't he done anything about death? Well, God's answer to our questions would be, I have. I sent my son. Jesus is God's answer to injustice. And Jesus' redemptive work displays God's saving power and God's saving grace. Christ's death shows us God's power. Jesus triumphed over all the powers of evil on the cross, disarming them, defeating them, opening them up to public scrutiny and public shame, as Paul says in Colossians. But the cross also shows us God's grace. We were forgiven for our sins because Christ died for us. Christ's resurrection shows us God's power. God raised Jesus from the dead. And it also shows us God's grace. God raised Jesus from the dead for us. And he raises us with Christ. And he fills us now with the Holy Spirit, this resurrection power as part of his project to currently make all things new. God is at work in, through, through Christ's redemptive work even now. What has God done about injustice and suffering? He sent Christ. Jesus confronts and defeats the powers that perpetuate injustice, like we hear in our text. Jesus promises to restore and to heal the world. With such power and such grace on display, Christians have ample reasons for us to love him, to trust him, even to fear him. So fear God. And this leads to the second principle. After we fear God, we should give cautious respect to our leaders. Give cautious respect to leaders. This passage encourages Christians to respect the civil authorities. Keep the king's command, says the text. It's the same in our confession of faith that we confessed earlier, and it's the same throughout the Bible. 1 Peter 2.17 says, fear God, honor the emperor. So we're clearly supposed to have respect for our leaders. But at the same time, Ecclesiastes 8 encourages caution. That, I think, is the tenor of verses 2 through 9. I might sum it up like this. Respect our political leaders, but don't give your heart over to them fully. Maintain a thoughtful distance between your identity and any sort of political or cultural leader. Show a cautious respect. 
Show cautious respect so that you are not crushed emotionally or existentially if a leader makes a mistake. Show cautious respect so that you are not so sucked into their gravitational pull that if they fall, you also fall. Show cautious respect so that when they make mistakes, you can speak the truth when it needs to be said. Because we will be called upon to speak the truth into our culture. Along with cautious respect, we also need courage. This is the third principle. Have the courage to speak the truth when you need to. Verse 1 in our text, the opening passage, or the opening verse in, in our passage says, who knows the interpretation of a thing? That word interpretation is only used in the Bible in one other place, the book of Daniel. And that word interpretation is also related to another word that's only used in one other place in the Bible, the, the narrative about Joseph. Now, the commonalities between Joseph and Daniel, that they were called upon, both of them were called upon to give an interpretation of a dream, speaking God's truth to the leaders and rulers of the day. This, of course, was risky. As you read the story of Joseph, the story of Daniel, they could have been killed if Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar didn't like what they had to say. Speaking the truth requires courage. Now, we won't be called upon to interpret dreams. We are not prophets like Daniel or Joseph. But Ecclesiastes 8.1 invites us to consider whether we are wise enough to engage a certain situation, and a situation of uncertainty, certainty and say what needs to be said. Let's look together at verse 5. Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. But again, in this passage, evil here primarily means evil in the sight of the king. And so whoever keeps the king's command, whether or not it's right, will escape the king's wrath. That's what it means to have no evil thing come upon them. So if you keep the king's command uncritically, you can escape the king's wrath, but the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. The wise person will know the right time to correct. The wise person will know the right time to resist. The wise person will know the right time to offer a just alternative. Will we be wise enough, courageous enough, to speak the truth to political power or cultural consensus? Well, we're not always sure about that, are we? How will the wise heart know? The sage doesn't tell us. There's a kind of a silence. He asserts that the wise heart will know, will know and then doesn't tell us anymore as much as we might long for him to tell us. How will we know? Well, if we look at the connections between Daniel and Joseph, there's at least a hint. Prayer. Both of these men were men of prayer. Wisdom and courage come through prayer. That's why the Apostle Paul asked for prayer all the time. We might think of Ephesians 6. He says, pray for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, again, we're not Paul. Just like we're not Daniel, we are not Joseph, but we are enough like them in our everyday vocations that we need to pray for wisdom and that we need to pray for courage so that when the opportunity comes to speak, we're ready for it. And then, in the meantime, while we're praying, while we're preparing, while we're waiting, seek to enjoy your life. That's the fourth principle of wisdom, enjoyment. Verse 8, 15, I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. 
It's really interesting, as the book of Ecclesiastes progresses, you you probably even hear it now, but you'll hear it in the coming weeks, the sage's emotions get more intense. And so the the two things that he seems to fixate on, death and joy, his emotions of that get even more intense as the book progresses. And so we'll hear some of the darkest, uh, deepest, darkest meditations on death uh, couched right next to some of the most glowing recommendations to find joy in life. Again, he he gets very intense as the book goes along, and here he says, I commend joy. This is the strongest language that he's heard yet. We've heard him talk about joy a number of times. This is as strong as he has ever said it yet. Like the wise physician, the sage prescribes joy for those who are weary of life's uncertainties. So if you are tired this morning, his word to you is try to enjoy your life. For some people, this might sound like an incredibly tone-deaf assertion to enjoy yourself. We might wonder if he's coming from a place of just kind of blind, naive privilege, where only the lucky few have the luxury to just check out and enjoy themselves. Well, that's not what the sage is saying here in our text. He is not saying, use your wealth, use your privilege to escape reality. Ignore the things that are going on while the rest of us just suffer. He is saying these words to those who are suffering. He looks at the world with eyes wide open and says, enjoy your life. Do your best to enjoy the things that God has given you. Recognize that the enjoyable things in your life have come from God. The sage's commendation of joy is not a, a coming from a place of privilege, but of humble faithfulness, even gratitude for what's going on. It's, it's an act of faith. And so he tells us this morning, as an act of faith, enjoy your life. Even if your external circumstances are screaming at you, why bother? Faith in God enables us to enjoy our lives. Faith in God also enables us to rest. And this is the fifth and final wise principle, rest. In verses 16 through 17, the sage says that those who agonize over the uncertainties of life cannot find rest. Their eyes do not see sleep. It's more empty toil that they are wasting their time with. But truly wise people know that they cannot know all of God's plan. And so they trust God and rest in faith. Here's Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. As hard as it may seem, when you're in a situation of great uncertainty, one of the best things that you can try to do is get some sleep, get some rest. Place your anxieties in the hands of God, who is the only one who's powerful enough and gracious enough to really preserve you and rest. So these are the principles of wisdom that enable us to face uncertainty, whether political uncertainty or the uncertainty of an unjust and wicked society. How are the righteous supposed to live? How are the wise supposed to act? Fear God. Show cautious respect. Have the courage to speak. Enjoy your life and find some rest. So do that this week as you weather the uncertainties ahead. Fear God. Spend time this week savoring his power and his grace. Confess the ways that your heart has been taken by other loves and ponder the mysteries of the cross and the empty tomb. Fear God. Grow in love for him and for his word. And then show cautious respect to our political and cultural leaders. And please, especially do this on social media. If you are on social media, show cautious respect. So many people, including Christians, use social media unwisely, either gushingly admiring someone or viciously tearing them down. Christians must be different. Show cautious respect. And then speak the truth with courage, in whatever ways you see fit, in whatever ways that you are able. And as you're going about this, pray that you would know the proper time and the just way. 
then enjoy your life. Do something fun this week. Really, do something fun this week. Play a game, call a friend, eat something delicious, and then get some sleep. Staying up late is likely not going to change the world for the better. Get some rest, because the future is in God's hands, not our own. Get some rest, because it takes energy to live with wisdom in uncertain times. It's taxing to be patient in the face of folly and wickedness, isn't it? It's draining for us to be courageous when we are faced with fear. And so take care of yourself, even while you're trying to live out your calling faithfully. When your body is well-fed and well-rested and your heart is filled with the joy of Christ, you'll be able to react with wisdom and creativity when the situation calls for it. Here's what living with these principles is like. When you grow in living through the principles of wisdom, it's like learning to be an artist. When you spend time with any artist, you'll see how they have developed a creative intuition, this uh, amazing ability to react to something unexpected, to roll with the punches and incorporate it into their project by leaning on their training and applying their training, their principles creatively. A skilled carpenter will be able to react well to finding out that a piece of wood doesn't fit quite according to the plan or doesn't look exactly the way that they thought it would. A skilled painter will be able to transform an unexpected splotch into part of the landscape. Like Bob Ross would say, these things are just happy accidents. And so lean into your training. Apply these principles creatively and then take comfort. Even though there's no playbook for the road ahead, even though there is no guarantee that our best efforts will succeed in this life, we have God's precious promises. We are 100% secure in Christ through his power, through his mercy. And the Holy Spirit will equip us with the ability to apply these wise principles with grace, with creativity, with humility, and with enjoyment. So even when we face uncertainty, brothers and sisters, we can enjoy our lives. And at the end of the day, we can rest in God's most perfect plan. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you would teach us and guard us and keep us. Keep us in the palm of your hand. Keep us in the, the, the focus of your eye. We ask that you would bless us with wisdom. Uh, knowing that we face uncertainty, I pray that you would give us grace to walk with faithfulness. These principles of wisdom that we hear from the text, I pray that we as the church would be able to live them out well and that, your, that the people in your world would see us uh, attempting to live with faithfulness and that they would see our self-sacrifice as we try to do these things well for, for their good. And I pray that as we surrender ourselves to this process of wise living, that our neighbors would see Christ and that his kingdom would come, and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord God, give us this grace. Protect us and keep us, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.